Yo, what's up, y'all? We are here, Buff Missionary in the building. It is 11.21 p.m. A little late video, but it has to be done. Uh, I didn't get my study in this morning. I went to church in person for once. Uh, it's been a while, snow, all this kind of stuff going on, and I've been tuning in online. Uh, Crosswalk, shout out my boy Taylor Bartram out there leading the music and stuff out there, so gotta support, you know how we roll. But anyways, I'm getting into Galatians here, chapter one, verses six through 10. That is the goal to check out this evening here. And uh, I prayed before getting on, uh, again, when you get into your Bible study, I encourage you to send up a word, ask the Holy Spirit to be with you and to inspire you and make sure that your mind is in a really good place. And uh, the, the point that we're trying to get across here is these four questions. I'm trying to pull this up here. I don't have my laptop with me, so I'm gonna try to see if I can find it on my uh, iPad. But I do have them here somewhere. I wrote them down at the beginning of my Bible. So just once again, to kind of give you the heads up on those four questions that we use for Bible study. And again, this is not, uh, a one a one trick pony kind of a thing. I don't even know if that's the phrase I'm looking for. There's all different kinds of methods you can use to study the Bible. This is just one that has been beneficial for me. And question one, what might God be saying to me in this verse or verses? Number two, how does this passage touch or intersect with my life? Three, what does any idea that stands out have to do with my relationship with God? And four, what is God's invitation to me in these verses? So we'll start out by reading through the text. And the section here is actually entitled Only One Gospel. So we'll see how that ties in to whatever these verses have to say. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Interesting. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Double down on it. For, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Okay, there's a lot going on here. And we start out with this first question of what might God be saying to me in this verse? Well, let's look at it and actually break it down. You have Paul who's writing to the Galatians. He gave them a really good introduction in the first five verses saying, hey, there's a graceful God, there's a peaceful God, a God who's willing to give of himself for you and you should glorify him always at all times forever and ever. Amen is what he says. And the very next thing that he says is I marvel I'm surprised. It blows my mind that you are turning away so soon from him who calls you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, right? So they've received this blessing, this thing that's really awesome, the grace, the peace, and this God who wants to do anything for them. And he's surprised that this other message, this other good news is turning them away from the real good news. And he's like, how, how can this be? How is this able to happen? How are you turning away so quickly from this thing to a different gospel? And he says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, I think that's interesting because, again, when you think of the context that we're dealing with here, we know from Luke's writing in his books of Luke and Acts that there were other people circulating different stories about Christ and just writing other fantastical things that may or may not have been happening that didn't match up with the rest of what was actually happening here as recorded in scripture. And uh, he's calling them out. He's like, this is a different gospel. This isn't the truth that you heard before and enjoyed and were uh, changed by. This is something else. And you're taking it hook, line and sinker. What's up with that? They want to pervert it. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be a curse. He doubles down on that. Whoever's trying to corrupt it, whoever's trying to twist it, whoever's trying to say that the good news is something other than the good news, let him be accursed. He says it twice. For do I seek to persuade men or God? And I think there's a hint here in the reasoning. It seems like people who are coming out with this different these different gospels are maybe portraying something that might seem easier for people to swallow or to accept. And the reason I say that is because Jesus did say that his message could be hard for some people to hear and to accept. And when you think of the fact that this is happening within just the Jewish sphere or the Israelite sphere at first, and it was difficult for some people to accept. We're not even talking about the Gentiles yet. So the Gentiles having their many different belief systems, uh, a lot of them were heavy into different types of idol worship, the Greek gods and so on. These are all out there, Roman deities and so on. Um, some people might've been twisting the gospel to accommodate or to, to, to like, like half truths kind of a thing and say, well, you can still be in, don't worry about all that stuff. Uh, but if you accept this, you're good to go. And the problem is, if we're talking about something that can change your life or impact your life in a positive way, um, the person who's giving you only the half truth is not doing you a favor. It might sound good because, oh, well, I don't have to give up all of this other stuff to join this. Cool, I can do it, it makes it easier. But you're really not getting the whole thing. You're not getting the whole benefit of it. And they're actually setting you up to get screwed up later. You see what I'm saying? So maybe that's something to have to do in it. He says, or do I seek to please men? So again, it seems like whatever these other gospels or different gospels were about, they were more about pleasing men than God, making it something more palatable or digestible for people within their context. And as a result, they're selling people short and setting them up for failure later. He said, for if I still please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. And even this line of itself is powerful because when, <laughs> look at the contrast, for if I still pleased men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. You could flip it and say that if he still pleased Christ, he would not be a bond servant of men. All right. And the reason that's interesting is because of that contrast. You have pleasing, which is something very freely given or done, and then you have bondservant, which is quite the opposite, right? But by doing one, you can lose out on the other one. By living a life that's all about pleasing men, you miss out on being in tight with God. And sometimes when you're in tight with God, you'll end up missing out on pleasing the men or the people around you. So. These different gospels, these new gospels, these other gospels that Paul is talking about here, I think were about being easier to digest for people. I think they were more about pleasing men and making it, uh, making it something just easier for people to deal with and to accept without needing to kind of take the whole truth and the whole gospel. And as a result, it was just something that was better for people and not necessarily something that was completely truthful and accurate. So with that as a context, again, we go to the question, what might God be saying to me in this verse? Well, I think that there's something here about turning away so easily and so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. When we think about the gospel, Jesus, God loves us. Jesus died for us to take the place of our sin and the the, the suffering and the, uh, the penalty that we should have paid on the cross. And as a result, we can live forever if we believe in that sacrifice. That's the gospel, plain and simple. And so it, it is very easy for people to go away from that simple truth and start adding all of these other things into the mix. Uh, if we look at a number of different religions and you ask them, what does it take to be saved? What must I do to be saved? The question we see repeated all throughout the, the New Testament, they keep it as simple as believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, right? Peter said that with Cornelius and it's, it's done over and over again. 
the simple gospel truth. And when people change it from that and say, well, yeah, you, you need to believe, but you also need to do this, 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 and this. You also need to do all of these other things. This, this is the checklist that we have that we believe we see in scripture. So these are the things you have to do if you want to be saved. I think that's people turning away from the gospel and the grace of Christ to a different gospel. It's not that these things are even bad. You know, a lot of the things that people are doing within their denominations may not necessarily be bad things or wrong things to do, but if they're becoming barriers to entry into a relationship, and even if you have people, humans, who are being the gatekeepers of this experience anyway, then I think there's a problem there, right? Um, I'll give you an example. You have, even within churches, you have conservative on one hand, you have liberal on the other side, uh, for sure. And the ones that are more on the conservative end, uh, we have something called the health message within Adventism. And it's a set of principles that I think the majority of people could really use if they wanted to level up their health experience. However, a lot of people will tie the health message to salvation and say, well, if you're not doing these things, then you're not holy enough. You're sinning essentially, and you're going to be lost. And I don't see the biblical or the prophetic inspiration for those types of statements. Some of them would be along the lines of uh, being a vegetarian or a vegan. There are a lot of Christians out there who are like, you can't eat cheese. If you do, you're going to hell. <laughs> you're a bad person. It's, it's incredible, but that's the mentality. And when you go to those churches that are more conservative, more along that line of thought, it can be very uncomfortable for people who express that they're at a different place in their journey and in their food experience. So it's like, it becomes a barrier to entry and the people who are already inside that feel like what they're doing is what God has called them to do. And they, they make it a barrier for others to get in. It's a different gospel. It's not the simple believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You see what I'm saying? So, and it happens so subtly and so interesting. And it's not even that it has to be something so far off from the truth. I think a lot of times when we, when we uh, think about a different gospel or something that's not truth, we think about something that's completely antithetical to the truth. When in reality, the most deceptive things are the things that look almost, almost exactly like the truth. It might be 98% truth. It might be 80% true. Still looks good, but there's enough in there to throw somebody off, right? And because it makes sense, because it makes more sense for me to be able to look at the things I'm doing and checklist it and say, well, uh, if I do this, then I know I had a good day. How do I track faith in God? Well, I can't track that because it's, it's not really something that you, can, that you can measure, but I can measure the things that I do. I can measure my good works. And as a result, that becomes my gospel instead of just the faith. I've redefined what it means to have faith because it makes more sense for me as opposed to just believing the gospel for what it is. And so more people get on that. More people get on it. it says it's not another which are but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. This is people, again, putting in their own emphasis and trying to make it something that it's not. So coming back around the third time, third time's a charm, right? What might God be saying to me in this verse? I think, I think at the end of the day, what, he's, what he would be trying to say to me is keep it simple. It's, it's a simple truth. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And that's an opportunity that everybody can experience. I think when it comes to sharing the gospel, as Paul is doing in this letter to the Galatians, he's keeping it simple. It's, it's what, four or five chapters in this book? It's not a lot. He's keeping it simple. And he's not taking a whole lot of time to help shift the mindset back to what the true gospel is. And I think for me, as a missionary, and I think for anybody who is a Christian who embraces the mission mentality, I think we're all called to keep it simple. 
and not to put up these barriers to entry for people just because it's something that I like to do or something that I'm more comfortable with in my life, right? Like there, there shouldn't be this standoffish, well, you ate meat, so you're going to hell kind of a thing. It, it, it shouldn't be like that. And yet in some Christian churches, it's exactly like that. And, it, you know, people will just treat you different and they'll just they'll pull out all the quotes and talk about how, oh, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and all this other stuff. And it's almost like they resent you for having a different lifestyle and they'll, they will treat you different. I've seen it. I've seen it. It can it can be something even to the uh, effect of, let's say, the LGBTQ community. Right. There's still people there dealing with a different lifestyle choice and that comes with its own different struggles and for a lot of christians it's hard to accept them because they say well what you're doing is a sin who you are is a sin well all of us are sinners we're just sinners in different ways <laughs> and the unfortunate part is it's easy for christians to pick on them because if they define their being as a sin, it's something that's visible. And I think I've talked about this before, but things like pride and arrogance are bigger sins. And the pride and arrogance that Christians have to try to get upset at the people with that lifestyle without realizing their own thing, that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, hey, you trying to call out that person for a speck in their eye while you got a log up in yours. Don't change the gospel. It's fit for everybody, regardless of their background, regardless of the situation. And every single person in here, like Paul was a sinner. <laughs> it's not like he became perfect all of a sudden. It's not like the disciples became perfect all of a sudden. They were all sinners. And yet they were still blessed with the opportunity to share the gospel. So it seems like that's something by the grace of God that anybody who is a sinner is able to partake of, and I shouldn't be the gatekeeper to who can enjoy that experience and who can't. It's interesting. So again, when it comes to being a missionary, I have to accept the simplicity of the gospel and the openness of the gospel. I think that's something that God's trying to communicate to me, uh, for one. And I think for another one here, going back to verses eight and nine, which kind of mirror each other, uh, I shouldn't try to get, I shouldn't preach something that's different from what the text is saying. I shouldn't go and try to add my own stuff in here and say, well, this is what it really means and, and start putting things in there that are not in there at all. There's a problem with that. There's a real issue with that. Paul had an issue with that. And then the last thing I think is, I should not live to seek to please men. It doesn't mean, and I'll talk about this in a second. Let me, let me say this first. I shouldn't live to please men. I shouldn't, I shouldn't change necessarily who I am to a degree where it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm like a ditto. I play Pokemon Go, so ditto is the first thing that came to mind. I shouldn't be like a ditto where everywhere I go, I'm engaging in everything that everyone else is doing just to try to fit in, right? That's, that's kind of weird for one, but as a Christian, it's like, I believe that you can go to different places and engage with people in their context, but it's different when you talk about I think there's limits and there's there's lines that shouldn't be crossed as a Christian for that. Those those are debatable, but that's just my thoughts. But and see now I forgot the other point I was gonna make. But a lot of times people do that. They'll they'll dumb down their own experience and who they are to make it more acceptable to somebody else. And I guess the flip side of that is, yeah, here's what it was, it came back. A lot of people will take this thing about, well, I'm not gonna live to please men. And they'll also take the other thing from that short, check the video, a couple videos back, where it's like, well, Christians shouldn't be loved by anyone because Jesus said, if you follow me, you're gonna be hated by the world. And because of that, they take this stance of, well, you're not gonna like me anyway, so I don't need to approach you with respect. I don't need to be kind in the words I'm using. I don't, I don't need to take your emotion into consideration at all. This is the hard truth and I'm gonna tell it to you. And if you don't accept it, the problem's not with me, it's with you. 
<laughs> that's that's how a lot of Christians take it because they say, well, I'm not leaving. I'm not living to please men. I'm leaving to please God. And they'll use that as a as a badge and a motivator for being disrespectful to other people. <laughs> and it makes no sense. But it's the little subtle things that people use to change the simplicity of the gospel and the approach and sharing it with others. Was Jesus rude about it? No. The, the people who society looked at as the worst, he approached with the most tact and carefulness. Like the woman caught in adultery. He barely said anything. Kneels down, starts writing. And then he asked, where are your accusers? That was, that was his question. That was the conversation with her. Not, oh, you messed up. They're about to stone you. What can I do? Nah. <laughs> but a lot of times Christians want to be the first ones to pick up them stones. It's crazy. It's crazy. So I think those are at least a few things that I, I believe God is telling me, uh, saying to me in this verse. And how does it, this passage intersect with my life? I kind of touched on that when it comes to being a missionary keep it simple you're going to engage with a lot of people in a lot of different areas who don't believe like you who don't look like you who don't talk like you they don't have the same culture background as you etc 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 but it doesn't mean that the principle of the gospel like it doesn't mean that i need to to transform it and make it something completely different or hide parts of it just to get more people to convert to it. And we do see that kind of thing where it's like, well, I'm gonna tell you this half truth because it's easier to, so I already talked about this, you get the point. We're not doing anyone any favors by doing that. So I think there's a, there's a line where we can keep it real and keep it real on principle, but also do it in a way that it's it's approachable to somebody else by someone else i gotta i i think there's a way that i can say that better we can we can okay here's the example i'll use when i was teaching my bible class in palau i had to learn when i first started the students didn't care half of them were sleeping in my class it was boring to them and the reason was because I had the mindset that what I had was the truth and I'm going to present it this way from my context. They didn't care about it because they couldn't connect with it. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the content or the principle of it, but it was that there was a connection missing because it was only coming from my viewpoint. When I took the time and realized, well, one, when I realized that I didn't want my class to suck, it meant that I had to learn my students more. So I spent more time with them, engaging with them than I did in my lesson plans, honestly. And I found the connection points of the gospel and of Jesus to all these different cultures. Like we had students from literally all over the world. Within my classroom, I had representatives from maybe 20 different countries all over the world. Different cultures, different backgrounds, different religions. And in the school, probably less than 10% of the kids are, are Adventist Christians, okay? But once I got to learn them, I started to see where the gospel intersected with their experience and their culture and their religions. And so I started talking about those things and connecting with them and all of a sudden they were interested. All of a sudden they loved the class and it became their favorite class because I was connecting with them. So you don't have to dumb it down you don't have to change it up completely and try to put all this extra sauce on it to make it appealing to someone else. But you do have to get to know the people you're trying to reach and find the points of the gospel that intersect with that experience because that's what's going to appeal for them. And then from there, they can get to know the other stuff. But I can't take it from my standpoint and say that the same starting point that I have needs to be the same starting point that everyone else has. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So I think that's what, uh, I think that's how it intersects with my life is realizing, hey, let me take more time to get to know other people and then I'll know the best ways to approach them with the gospel. And I think that's the best thing to do. 
Uh, you might have seen some people standing on the street corners on their little boxes, just yelling out stuff. And it's kind of weird. It's kind of uncomfortable. It's kind of unsettling. How much connecting is that person doing with the people walking by? And people don't like it because everyone, everyone feels a little bit condemned. It does reach some people, but it doesn't reach everybody. And it doesn't necessarily take the time and the opportunity to get to know people to find out the best ways to approach them. And I think that's something that we can do if we're interested in sharing the gospel and the good news with others. Number three, what does any idea that stands out have to do with my relationship with God? Well, I think the probably the biggest thing here is seeking to the, the opposite of that last thing. Here's the question Paul asks for, do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still, for if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I think that the thing, the thing that really ties into the relationship here is seeking to please God. And I'm going to extend it because I think that you can, based on the, the story I just told, I think that you can please men by seeking the best way to relate to them with the gospel. And in so doing, you can please God. I don't think that they have to be separate. I don't think that they should be separate because if you just try to please people and appease to them, uh, you're probably going to be telling half truths and so on. You're probably going to be trying to sell them short just to get them in, which is not helpful for you or them. But when it comes to that relationship with God, just realizing, you know what? The best thing that I can do to, to please God is going to be to get to know the people I want to reach and then share with them on their terms. I think, I think that's how uh, this verse helps with, uh, with my relationship with God, our relationship with God in this context. And uh, the last part, what is God's invitation to me in these verses? Well, I think it's pretty clear. One, I think it's to turn back to the true gospel, which is that John 3, 16. It's the most famous verse in the Bible for a reason. People who are not even Christian may not have even opened up a Bible. There's a lot of them out there who can quote this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the simple truth of the gospel. And to not turn away from it. I think that's the invitation, to turn to it to not turn away from it, to not come up with something that's beyond that and still try to call it gospel. I think that's the invitation there. I think the invitation is to seek to please God by reaching people in a way that's beneficial to them and not something that's going to harm them either through half truth or just straight up lies. So I think there's a lot of really good invitations there. Only one gospel in this passage. I like that. I like that. Well, this was good. This is good stuff. And uh, there's gonna be more to come. Hopefully I get these done in the morning. I will get some more done in the morning as opposed to uh, 11.49 p.m. on a Saturday night, you know what I'm saying? But we out here. <laughs> and with that, hope you enjoyed it. Like, subscribe, and share. You know how we roll. You know how we do. Uh, we're gonna be trying to get on this at least four or five mornings next week. So. Who knows? We might get through Galatians in a, in a few weeks or so, but that's all right. There's no rush. When you're working with the word of God, let it speak to you. Don't rush it. Let the spirit do his thing. But hey, we out here and we out. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.